All right, gang. We're starting to get into some of the training stuff. This is where everything starts getting fun. I got to admit, um, it was really cool to hear Brianna Christie uh, basically saying, you know, for the first time, this stuff's actually coming together. And that's pretty cool, right? Like the, the lectures that we've had the past couple of weeks really should start being summative, right? Like we should start be, we should be putting together the big picture at this point. Everything that we're going to be talking about today is essentially culminated or everything that we're going to be talking about today is essentially culminating from respiratory physiology, cardiovascular physiology, acid base physiology, and essentially how the body's going to adapt to each one of those things or how, or essentially how we're going to adapt in the face of change or in the face of disruption away from homeostasis when we're doing endurance training. So in order to talk about training, we need to talk about two kind of key factors or, or two key principles of training. These apply to both resistance training, you know, gains, right? And these apply to running, but these also apply to other types of endurance training as well. So we have overload and we have specificity. Overload is essentially saying that we have to progressively add difficulty or progressively add intensity or progressively add levels beyond which we are accustomed to. In general, this is something that's going to be applied to resistance training or endurance training, right? So it's, it's are we running faster? Are we running further? Are we running longer? That's, that's how we overload the system. Resistance training, it would be, are we adding more weight? Are we adding more reps? Are we adding more weight? Are we adding more reps? Are we adding more sets, right? Essentially, we can manipulate this with frequency, intensity, and duration. Specificity is, are we training that which we want to achieve? Are we training that form with which we want to achieve? So let's say we want to be getting better at running, if we want to get better at running, we have to train running. If we want to get better at lifting, we have to train lifting. So regardless, right? Like if, so what I'm, what I really want you guys to focus on with specificity is that we have to be paying attention to the modality of the training stimulus. And what that means is that means if you want to get better at something, you need to be training to get better at that thing, right? It sounds intuitive, but you'd be amazed how many people don't pay attention to this. This would be like trying to race a triathlon without ever training swimming, right? Right? It, it doesn't make sense. Same thing here. You have to train in the mechanism with which you want to compete or with which you want to improve, so since this lecture is on endurance training or the principles of endurance training and adaptation to endurance training, we're going to have to talk VO2 max, right? VO2 max is going to be the maximal amount of oxygen that you can consume and utilize. We've already gone over this before. This, this slide deck or this, this slide specifically should look somewhat familiar. When it comes to exercise training programs to increase VO2 max, what we need to have is we need to have a minimum of 20 minutes in length. We have to have those occurring three or more times a week, and we have to have them occurring at greater than 50% intensity of our VO2 max. So we got to be working relatively hard, relatively long, and relatively often. If we're going by those three standards, and those are our minimums, you can actually improve VO2 max as much as 20% or as low as 3%. Regardless, an improvement is an improvement is an improvement right? The, the individuals that are going to respond with that 20% increase are really going to be either the genetic freaks, the ones that are just gifted at the sport, or the ones that are completely untrained. So if you come into an, if you come into an, an endurance training program relatively unfit, your fitness level is going to increase pretty dramatically. Whereas if you come into a training program relatively fit, we're just working up in minutia here. We're just incrementally adding to, right? We're progressively overloading. Whereas the individual that has no training experience, they're going to make leaps and bounds of experience, or they're going to, they're going to improve in leaps and bounds for a while until it catches up. So now there's this concept of relative VO2 max. That I think that we've talked about a little bit before, but I want to, I want to talk about a little bit again. And that's essentially relative VO2 max is a VO2 max that's been normalized to your body weight. So that allows us to cross compare, a, 
to individuals or like this allows us to compare across individuals. So it allow myself who's 5'10", we're going to say 5'10 and a half. It's not true to like my wife. My wife's five foot tall. Obviously, I'm going to have bigger lung capacity than she is because my lungs are just bigger. So my absolute VO2 max is going to be a little bit higher than hers. However, if we normalize to our body weight or normalize to our body size, that's when we can actually have a true comparison. It'll allow us to have be comparing apples to apples rather than apples to oranges or tall to short, right? This relative VO2 max is actually going to be able to range pretty drastically. It can range from a, like realistically a couple of milliliters per kilogram per minute in, in conditions like COPD or morbid obesity or pulmonary transplants, and it can go all the way up to 90 plus. This is going to be some of your elite cyclists, elite rowers, elite runners are really going to have VO2 maxes that are through the roof. It's one of the coolest things to ever witness is a really high VO2 max. What's almost a little bit depressing is that up to 50% of your VO2 max is actually going to be genetically contributed. So that means that your improvements, whatever improvements you make, are going to be 50% determined by your genetics. So if you're not built to be a runner, you're probably not going to be a very great runner. If you're not built to have a really high VO2 max, you're probably not going to have a really high VO2 max. Does that mean that you can't be fit and that mean that you can't perform? No, not necessarily, but it is a, a big contributor's genetics here. So what about the response to endurance training, right? Well, the response to endurance training is not just going to be driven by the intensity, the duration, the frequency. Some of it's also going to be driven by our genetics again, right? So some research has actually shown that up to 47% of the variability in response to exercise training is actually due to genetics. So that's to say, what's the difference between myself and um, like Abby Crane, one of our, one of our soccer players here at, at UNG? What's to say that our response to endurance exercise is going to be the same or different? Well, if we do the exact same training protocol and we have different outcomes, 40% of that, 47% of that difference in outcome is likely due to genetics. Kind of crazy. And what this, what this really creates is like a separation, right? So we actually get like a, a, a a bifurcation, if you will, where we're going to start creating high responders and low responders to endurance training. And so if we're going to be designing a research study, if we're going to be looking at a performance program, we almost have to be able to take and separate the highest half and the lowest half or the top responders and the lowest responders and actually compare to see how much they improve relative to each other. Because about 47%, about 50% of their response is going to be genetic. That means the other 50% is going to be due to things other than genetics, i.e. the training program. So just like that slide said a couple of minutes ago, there's really a couple of things that we can manipulate in order to really improve VO2 max. And it's going to be our frequency, our intensity, and our duration. And we know that that duration needs to be at least 20 minutes. We know that that intensity needs to be at least 50%, more like significantly higher. And we also know that that, that uh, frequency needs to be at least three times a week, more like five to six days per week. If we're doing all this training, if we're doing all this running, if we're doing, I, I keep using running, sorry, it's just an easier thing for me to think of because who wants to spend hours and hours on a bicycle seat or rowing, right? at least running, you're kind of like seeing stuff change, rowing, you're just looking at water, you're staring at a wall. So how does endurance training really improve VO2 max? Let's break down what is VO2 max. And essentially, VO2 max is maximal cardiac output, which is Q equals HR times SV, or heart rate times stroke volume, times the maximal AVO2 difference. So what we're looking at is how much blood can the heart pump out and how much oxygen can we extract as we're going through the body, right? AVO2 difference is going to be signifying our O2 extraction or our O2 utilization. And then our cardiac output is going to be really testing our pulmonary system to see how much blood we can push out and, and fill with oxygen and get through the body, right? So that 
that VO2 max equals maximal out cardiac output times a VO2 difference is known as the Fick equation. And then our cardiac output we've already gone over. And if you remember from our cardiopulmonary lecture, heart rate, it's really not going to change because we only have a certain threshold, right? Like we can only go so high. That bike pump can only pump so fast. Our heart can only ever pump so fast. And realistically, that heart rate is not going to change too much. If anything, the fitter we get, the slower our heart rate gets. It becomes stronger, so it doesn't have to pump as fast. So the major thing that's going to be driving changes here is going to be our stroke volume. And so what that stroke volume essentially is, and this is, again, this is all review, is end diastolic volume minus end systolic volume. And that's what you're looking at over here on the graph or on this figure, right? So end diastolic volume, end filling, how much blood do we have present in the ventricles at the end of a full filling cycle? Contraction, systole, how much blood do we have left, right? So what is the difference at stroke volume is essentially how much blood gets pushed out. So it's it's the difference between um, how much is there at the end of diastole and how much is there at the end of systole. So how, how are we going to change that diastolic volume? How are we really going to maximize end diastolic volume? Because that's what's going to be driving most of these changes here. The higher we can get this end diastolic volume, really a bigger stroke volume we're going to have. So one of the major, major ways is an increased stretch mechanism. And this is, this is what's called the Frank Starling mechanism. And that is essentially increased stretch equals increased contractility. We actually, we actually are going to maximize the amount of actin and myosin interactions that can occur as we're stretching out the heart, as we're filling the heart, we're actually increasing the amount, obviously, of blood that's in there, but the amount of myosin cross bridge attachment sites that can occur. So think of it like pulling back a slingshot. The further you load that slingshot back, the faster it's going to come out, the faster that blood's going to come out. So we can manipulate that stretch, that pulling back of the slingshot, that filling of the water balloon by increasing our plasma volume right? It, it kind of occurs. It's not going to occur super acutely. Increasing our venous return, so pumping blood back to the heart faster, is definitely going to happen, right? So we can, we can actually increase the speed at which we bring blood back to the heart so that we can fill that heart just a little bit more. If we fill that heart just a little bit more, we're going to be able to shoot out just a little bit more blood. And that's exactly what we're looking for, right? Is how much can we stretch that heart so that it can shoot out more? Cardiac contractility is, is really just referring to the overall strength of the contraction. There is some acute increases in cardiac contractility that can occur with exercise training, but realistically, we don't, we don't have a great picture of what's going on with chronic adaptation to training. So what's like, we don't have an idea of what happens if you take on endurance training for three months, six months, one year, two years, six years, right? What we do know is that at least in animals, as the ventricle gets stronger, it gets better able to like wring out that blood. So it gets better able to actually push blood out with systole, right? We get, imagine like squeezing out a rag full of water. We're trying to basically squeeze out just that much more blood. And that does seem to occur as you get um, as you get more trained, at least in animals, which I guess we're animals. So another major concept when it comes to stroke volume is going to be our afterload. And afterload is essentially that back pressure. So it's, it's what does it look like immediately outside of the heart? How much resistance to flow are we going to have as soon as we leave the heart? What we know is that following exercise training, there's actually a decreased peripheral resistance, right? So we actually are going to have vasodilatory effects occurring as we're exercising. We're going to be opening up blood vessels because we need to get blood to the working muscle. We're going to be dilating those vessels because we need to get blood to those muscles. So that means that we're actually going to have a decrease in peripheral resistance. 
in order to make up some of that, if we had too much of a decrease in blood pressure, we'd faint, right? If, you, if you've ever had low blood pressure and you kind of see the world go black, that would happen. In order to make up for that, in order to make up for that decreased pressure, we're actually going to increase our cardiac output. And by increasing our cardiac output, we're actually able to maintain like a little bit more of a tone in our vascular system, and we're able to help maintain that arterial pressure. So when it comes to the Fick equation, we, we just finished the cardiac output part, right? Like we just finished the HR times SV in parentheses and quotes and whatever. The second half of that was essentially max AVO2 difference. And what we want with a max AVO2 difference is we want to be able to extract out a lot of oxygen. As we're going through the capillary bed, we want to be able to grab that oxygen and pull it away. And what we, what we get with exercise, what we get with chronic exercise training, is we actually get an enhanced ability to pull oxygen out of the blood. We get, we get this maximal AVO2 difference capability. What's also awesome is that we actually get increased capillary dis density. So remember we talked about the pulmonary system and, and we talked about the vascular system a couple of weeks ago, and we were all talking about how our vascular system is relatively fixed in its length. And that's true in acute things and in short time domains, but resistance, or not resistance, but endurance exercise training actually is going to facilitate growth of new vasculature. We're actually going to be creating more, more blood vessels because we're going to be able to fuel our exercise. We're going to be more efficient with our use of fuel, and we're actually going to be able to work harder. So we're going to generate more vascular tissue. And what's really, really cool here, at least I think it is, is that mitochondrial capacity is not ever a key limiter in sports performance. It's not ever a key limiter in endurance performance. We actually cannot match our cardiac output with our, with our, with our mitochondrial density. So our, we have more mitochondria than we could ever need. The main limiter is our ability to actually get oxygen to our tissue. What is this increased endurance training really going to do to our body? What is it going to do to our homeostasis? What's it going to do to our set point? Well, realistically, in the first couple of weeks, what we're going to see is neural adaptation. We're going to get better at the movement. We're going to improve our economy of motion. Our neural patterns are going to get better. Our excitation contraction coupling, our size principle, our recruitment of muscle fibers, all of that is going to get better. So we're going to get better at doing the exercise neurally first. And then some of the first training adaptations that you're going to get, some of the main training adaptations that you're going to get is a better way of putting that, is going to be a muscle fiber type shift. So we're actually going to move towards a type 1 fiber. We're going to move from 2X to 2A. We're going to move and actually start recreating or, or trying, to, trying to mimic type 1 fibers because they, fuel, or they, they work better for this type of exercise, right? They're... they're they're more fatigue resistance. They're longer duration exercise fibers. And that's what we're looking for when we're going for endurance events. We're going to get mitochondrial biogenesis. Fancy term for saying we're getting new mitochondria. We're making new mitochondria. We're making new powerhouses of the cell. If we're having new mitochondria, then we're getting more electron transport chain. We're getting all of this stuff, right? Like we're better able to burn fat. We're better able to burn carbs. We're better able to make high levels of ATP. That would make sense if we're going through so many repeated contractions because those contractions are going to be using ATP. And we're also going to get that increased capillary density. So we're going to have to be able to fuel that workload. We're going to have to be able to get blood and oxygen to that muscle, but we're also going to have to be able to pull crap off of that. We're also going to have to be able to pull CO2, pull lactate, pull hydrogen ions. So we're going to actually have increased capillary density as well. So wait a second, if I run, does that mean that all my gains are going to go through the window? Not necessarily, right? What we know is that endurance training is really going to facilitate the shift from super fast to more of a slow twitch fiber. 
And what's funny is this is actually indicative of an increased training status. So as we get better trained, as we increase our training abilities, we're actually going to just transition from a type 2X to a type 2A. Type 2A is kind of like the best of both worlds, right? Like they've got higher mitochondria, they're able to they're better able to use all types of fuel. They're not quite so glycolytic, but they have high force capacity. They've got high force production capacity. It's kind of like the Goldilocks, right? Type 2X, too fast. Type 1, too slow. Type 2A, right, happy, right? So we're actually going to shift our myosin ATPase because the major driver here in type 1 and type 2X is going to be myosin ATPase. The faster the myosin ATPase, the more like a type 2X it is. The slower the myosin ATPase, the more like a type 1 fiber. So essentially, what you get with those type 1 fibers is an increased mechanical efficiency. So you get more work done per unit of ATP. It's not cycling so much, right? That fast ATPS is, ATPase is cycling really fast. I'm doing this because it's really fast, kind of. But that slow myosin ATPase is actually able to fully complete each cycle, right? And then if we imagine that fast ATPase, it's kind of short stroking. Whereas slow myosin ATPase is able to get that full, complete ratchet and recock, ratchet and recock. Now, the magnitude of this shift is really going to be driven by the type of exercise that you're doing, the type of training that you're doing, and really how, how long those training periods are. Because if you're doing really intense exercise that's going to be highly glycolytic, you're not going to get this transition as heavy of a transition towards type 1 fibers. But if you go from doing exclusively bodybuilding training to doing exclusively long distance triathlon training, such as Nick Bear, who's he's actually got a really cool YouTube channel if you guys ever want to follow him. It's it's really the shift in fiber type is really going to be driven by the intensity and duration of that exercise and training age somewhat, right? What I want you guys to really know though is there is not ever a complete shift from 2x to 1, right? Like it's not like every single muscle fiber that you have in your body is going to make this transition. It's just your body trying to find its ability to find homeostasis when it's being deviated, when we're going through these exercise bouts. It's just our body trying to find homeostasis. So it's never going to push all the way one way or push all the way the other way. So we've already mentioned this. I'm not going to I'm not going to harp on it too much, but essentially you're you're going to get that increased capillary density. And and what I really want to show you is that all of this is muscle tissue, right? All of these little fruit loop looking things are going to be capillaries. If you look, the top is deconditioned and the bottom is normal, or let's call it conditioned. What happens is that as you add capillaries, as we add fruit loops into the equation, we're actually going to be decreasing the diffusion distance. Look at how far oxygen has to travel to get from this capillary to this group of muscle cells right? Like that's a pretty good distance. It's more than just one cell away like we have at the lungs. So there's going to be a transit time that has to happen here. So this muscle tissue, this muscle fiber right here is not going to be able to get as much oxygen as it needs when it needs it. But if we increase the density of those capillaries, we're going to decrease the diffusion distance, right? We're going to see, oh, look, I don't have to travel as far in order to get oxygen in order to get blood or in order to get rid of CO2 or lactate or hydrogen ions. The diffusion distance is significantly decreased. So what do you think that would do to our ability to actually pull off oxygen? It's going to significantly increase it, right? Our ability to actually pull and extract oxygen is going to be significantly enhanced as we increase our capillary dis density because these muscles are not limited by their mitochondrial content. Right? They're only limited by the ability to receive oxygen. So if we increase our ability to give oxygen, we're going to be able to meet that demand by receiving it. So I've already used this term a couple of times, but essentially mitochondrial biogenesis just means that we're creating more mitochondria. It means that our genes are being written and transcribed to say, hey, we need more. We need more mitochondria, right? And I'm sorry that this kind of looks like poop or something. I don't even know. It kind of looks like a tick. Not, I guess not a tick. 
larva or something like that. Realistically, when it comes to mitochondria, we have two populations, two primary populations. We're going to have subsarcolemmal, which means that they're going to sit below the membrane. And we have intermyofibular, which is the gross majority, right? Up to 80% of our mitochondria, this intermyofibrilla. And those are actually going to be lying within and amongst those contractile proteins. So it's going to be within and amongst that actin and that myosin and those Z-discs and the titan and all that. When it comes to endurance training, both of these populations are going to increase, both subsarcolemmal and intermyofibular. You can actually see a 50 to 100% increase after only six weeks of training, right? Like that is crazy. We can double our mitochondrial population in just six weeks of taking on endurance exercise. It's wild. But what do you think that that does to our exercise? What do you think that's going to do to our ability to exercise? Well, if we know that anaerobic glycolysis is really going on without the mitochondria, and we know that aerobic metabolism requires mitochondria, but we just doubled that mitochondria, we will actually be able to reach steady state faster. So we're actually able to flip out of anaerobic glycolysis and out of anaerobic energy systems and into aerobic energy systems dramatically faster by increasing our mitochondrial content. So we're actually able to minimize the amount of carbohydrate that we're going to be using and maximize the amount of fat that we're going to be using. Because remember, anaerobically, we can only use ATP, PCR, or, gly or glucose or glycogen. We can only use carbohydrate, but our mitochondria can burn both. So the faster we can reach steady state, the faster we can be burning fat. And the more likely we are to conserve our blood sugar and conserve our carbohydrate. So that if that line comes running in the door, we're more likely to be able to get away when we need to. So something that's really neat about muscle fueling, right? Since we just talked about mitochondria, we'll keep talking about muscle fueling. What's really neat about muscle fueling is that with exercise, with endurance exercise especially, we're actually going to see an increased translocation of GLUT4. Now, if you remember from the hormone chapter, GLUT4 is glucose transporter 4. We can have insulin that binds to an insulin receptor goes through a series of phosphorylation steps and translocates GLUT4 to the membrane, exercise can actually do this independently. So individuals that suffer from high blood sugar usually either take insulin or they can exercise. And exercise is going to help drive that blood sugar down because we have a greater amount of, of glucose transporters on the outside of the cell. What's really kind of funny though is it, it it's almost counterintuitive, but as we get better at exercise, as we get better at endurance exercise specifically, we're actually going to minimize the amount of glucose utilization that's going to be occurring. We're going to actually minimize how much glucose we're going to pull out of the cell or out of the blood and put into the cell. We're going to actually preserve that blood sugar for when we need to get away from the lion, but we're, we're better adapted. We're better able to rapidly pull from that blood sugar or that muscle glycogen when we need it. So it's almost like we're creating an ability to have a spare tank, right? By increasing our endurance training, we get better at burning fat and we start using fat more because we have more mitochondria, but we also get better at grabbing carbohydrate when we need it because we put more receptors or more transporters on the surface. Kind of cool. So I just said it on the last slide, but... When it comes to fueling, when it, especially with endurance training, our body is going to get really, really good at burning fat, right? Fat is, is a higher quantity within our body. We have the ability to pull from larger stores if we're burning fat than if we're burning carbohydrate. And we're also not, I just said that super stupid, and we're also not going to have the production of lactate and that hydrogen ion. We're going to be cycling through Krebs and we're going to be creating acetyl-CoA's, but we're not going to be generating that lactate and that hydrogen, which is kind of a cool thing. And we're going to be using stored energy so that we can save that blood sugar, save that immediately available energy if we need it. 
And we're going to do this a couple ways. One, we're going to increase the delivery of fat. We're going to do that because we just increased our capillary density. We can actually put fat where it needs to go faster because we have more roads, right? Trucks on the road, you have a couple of options. You can either increase the amount of load on one truck to increase how, like how much gets delivered, or you can increase the number of trucks on the road. By increasing the capillary density, we're increasing the number of trucks on the road. We're increasing the ability to send blood away or send fat toward where we need it to be. We're going to have an increased ability to transport fat inside of the cell. And then we're also going to have an increased transport of fat into the mitochondria. So basically, we optimize fat burning from the fat tissue itself, sending it to the working muscle, pulling it from the blood into the muscle, and then pulling it from the muscle into the mitochondria. So we've optimized everywhere around the, around the situation. We've optimized the logistics of fat burning. Something that's really kind of neat here as well, and, the, and these kind of like overlap, is that when we start increased fat burning, when we start increasing beta oxidation, when we start increasing lipolysis, all three of those words mean the same thing, we're actually going to be producing that acetyl-CoA and a citrate. And if you go all the way back to when we were talking about bioenergetics and you start looking at things that are going to inhibit, inhibit, inhibit glycolysis, what you'll notice is that phosphofructokinase is actually inhibited by citrate in high levels of citrate. So by burning fat, we're actually inhibiting the burning of carbohydrate. So we're delaying the need to rely on that carbohydrate directly. Kind of neat. So this is a really good summative slide for how we're going to be improving fueling associated with endurance training. Let's go ahead and have a hard stop right here. Remember this, start memorizing this, understanding the concepts of changing capillary density, increasing mitochondrial number, all of that. And then let's pick up the rest of this lecture, second half of this lecture in video two.